Okay, howdy. September 13, 2020 today. Woohoo! As I was telling everybody uh, before I started uh, recording here, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. 2020 vision on Him. Okay, because that's very, very important. Um, so I wanted to share the 10 scriptures that Satan hates the most. These are 10 that a lot of brothers and sisters out there use as well as uh, myself and Kathy. Uh, in the many years of dealing with demons, we've, uh, we have never encountered an evil spirit that doubted God's word. Have you, Kathy? Nope. No, I didn't think so. So Satan twists scripture and misapplies the Bible, but he never doubts the veracity of what God has said. So I'm going to go on with this and show you those scriptures but first let's go here Isaiah 55 11 says so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing where to I sent it that's God's word amen that's what he said it does not come back void the enemy hates this scripture too, but this is not one that, uh, this is one that you could definitely use, but I'm going to share 10 more. Slide three is something uh, I thought about too, uh, and uh, James 2.19 tells us, Thou believest that there is one God, thou dost well, the devils also believe and tremble. See, the devil, he knows God's word because he was there with God before he got kicked out of heaven. So he knows God's word very well, better than most of us. Um, I'm gonna go on here and... Uh, Satan believes every word in the Bible, but he especially dreads certain passages because these scriptures have a direct bearing on overcoming his strategy to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, just like in these pictures here. Okay, so I'm looking in the room. Hello, firm believer, 568. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Glad to have you here. So um, during the many exorcisms that me and Kathy have done, <laughs> as directed to do by the Lord in his will, we have noticed that certain Bible verses are particularly feared by the forces of darkness. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And quoting these scriptures during <laughs> one of those demonic confrontations has shown us which portions of the Bible are most effective in defeating the attacks of Satan. I encourage every Christian to memorize these verses. Have them ready to use in any instance when the devil tempts or oppresses. Because we can stand on the truth of Scripture. Just as Jesus did during the temptation of the devil. When he thrice declared, it is written. You can have the same victory over evil that Christ did. Satan tempted Jesus in the flesh first. Then the soul. And then the spirit. Let's take a look at that Scripture. <clears throat> Let's go to Matthew 4, verses 4 through 7, if you have your Bibles ready. If you don't, you can always look at these later, because this is being recorded, and you can go back to it and look it over, but I'm just going to read it. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now Jesus had went out of the desert, directed to the Holy Spirit, to go out and be tempted of the devil. And when the devil first tempted him, what did he tempt him with? The flesh. So he tempted him with bread, okay? So he's, he's trying to say, hey, I'll, you know, I'll feed you, man. And Jesus is giving him the word. Then the devil take him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. There he is attempted in the soul, wasn't he? Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he was tempted in the spirit. 
So we're seeing all three. So when you see that, soon after Jesus had quoted those scriptures, the devil left. The Bible says, Submit yourselves there to, for to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. What the devil do? He fled, didn't he? He, he, he was like, I'm out of here. So, just, the, just as the devil left him, Satan will also flee from you as you trust in the truth of God's word. So, let's see here. Let's go to Luke 10, 19, number one. This one the devil hates, okay? Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Hmm, Satan hates this scripture because of its assurance that nothing is to be feared when advancing against the enemy. The disciples of Christ had just returned from their first evangelism expedition. During this time of training, the disciples exercised <clears throat> evil spirits. Luke ten seventeen tells us they rejoiced that the demons were subject to them when they used the name of Jesus. Though exorcism had been previously practiced among devout Jews, no one had ever attempted to expel demons by the mention of that name. <laughs> Even today, Satan tries to keep God's people in ignorance of the authority Christ extended to his disciples and to every born again believer. That means you if you're born again. When we walk in faith and dare to deal with demons, nothing the enemy can do will hurt us. The scripture says so. God's word does not come back void, remember? When we shrink back in fear and fail to boldly confront the forces of darkness, we're more susceptible to Satan's attacks. So we use this verse to enforce our authority over Satan. That's why he hates it so bad. So let's go to the next one here. Romans 8, 1. Hmm. Now, a lot of today's Christianity kicks out part of this scripture. I'm going to read the whole scripture as it's supposed to be read. Most of Christianity today will say, There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. They leave it at that. But it goes on. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see that? Satan hates this scripture because it liberates God's people from false self-condemnation. <clears throat> Intimidation by false guilt is one of the devil's most frequent tactics. When we ask Christ to forgive our sins, his mercy blots out how many transgressions? Every transgression, right? Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren, uh, delights in heaping false guilt on forgiven Christians. Those who heed Satan's word of condemnation can't fight effectively against satanic forces because they feel unworthy. You are worthy. If you are forgiven, you are worthy. But a forgiven Christian cannot be spiritually indicted for any evil he has committed. Romans 8, 1 must be thrown back in Satan's face as a spiritual antidote to his judgmental accusations. So, we use this verse to silence the reproaches of our enemy. He is our enemy. So, let's go to number three here. What's number three? Let's see. Oh, Philippians 2, 9 through 10. Look at that. Wherefore God is also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Here's why Satan hates that. Because it explains how effectively Christians can enforce the authority invested in the name of Jesus. <sighs> this passage establishes the supremacy of Christ's name. <clears throat> Angels in heaven, men on earth, and every demon in hell all are obligated by choice or by compulsion to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. The sovereign power of God 
sovereign, sorry, <laughs> I read that wrong. Sovereign power of God is all encompassing. His dominion over all forces the demons to flee. Use this verse to demonstrate the might in his name, in Christ's name. At the name of Jesus. Got that? Oh, he hates that. Devil hates it when I'm. I'm going to say it again. At the name of Jesus. Can you say that at home with me? Ready? At the name of Jesus. That's right. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's go to number four. First John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What did he do? He destroyed the works of the devil. No wonder the enemy hates this scripture. He destroyed the works of the devil. Because it, this, he hates this scripture because it proclaims the eternal victory of Christ over him. Jesus Christ, by his crucifixion and resurrection, conquered death. Thus, Satan, the angel of death and darkness, he was defeated. 1 John 3, 8 gives every Christian the right to declare a victory which he has already been won which has already been won through Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his rising from the dead the song victory in Jesus comes to mind oh you can sing it if you want go ahead though the devil's works may appear dreadful by faith we can perceive them as destroyed so we use this verse to remind demons their power over Christians has been shattered it's not there it's not there he, i always sing the song kathy likes this too you can't touch this do, 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 can't touch this yeah that's right he can't touch this all right let's go on to number five james 4 7 says submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will what what did he do from jesus he fleed didn't he He's like, man, I'm out of here. Forget it. This guy's not listening. Satan hates that scripture because he knows if we continue to resist him, he'll eventually have to give up. Some Christians wrongfully assume that this passage of scripture is enforceable by single declaration of resistance. The meaning of the verb resist is to continue to enforce the authority of God's word even when it initially appears that Satan may not obey the command. Believe me, there's times where we've been in um, exorcisms uh, and at that time the devil didn't want to leave. Well, we just keep on insisting he leaves. And we keep resisting him. And we just don't let him just stay there. It's just not going to happen. That's the power of the name of Jesus. Christians need to tell the devil where to go and what to do. And then walk in faith believing he has complied despite appearances to the contrary. Persistent resistance to Satan brings about the eventual surrender of the devil. So we use this verse to demand that Satan leaves us alone. Leaves you alone. Let's go to number six. Oh, I love this one. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and an intents of the heart why does satan hate the scripture hmm well that'd be because his evil agenda is defeated when we quote god's word in spiritual warfare during exorcism we've learned to literally apply this truth We've actually held a Bible in our hand and waved it in the air as if brandishing a sword. I've watched demons duck and swerve to avoid being smitten by the sword of God's word. This literal application in the spiritual realm illustrates how effective God's word can be to cut through error and establish the truth. Because the word can divide soul and spirit is able to reach the heart of unbelievers by separating the condition of their spirit from the lies their soul, their mind, that nature has believed. So we use that verse as an offensive weapon to turn back Satan's attacks. Let's go to number seven. Oh, love this one. Ah, 
John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, there's different ways of saying it. Some people say the truth shall make you free. Some people say the truth shall set you free. But it is the truth that will set you free or make you free. Let's remember that. Satan hates this scripture because God's word brings true freedom in contrast to just the freedom of sin that leads to spiritual slavery. Satan is a liar, the father of it, and is referred to in the Bible as the father of it. Just as Adam and Eve were first tempted with a lie, we too are spiritually misled when we succumb to the falsehood of the enemy. When we fail to stand on scripture, our thinking can be twisted and we may experience defeat because we believe the lies of the devil instead of the truth that God declares. The truth is, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Spiritual freedom comes when we use this verse to make the devil accountable to God's truth. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. Let's go to the next one. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Does it say some truth there? No, no. It says all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you the things to come. Satan hates that scripture because he knows Christians can be easily deceived by his lies when they're not spirit-led. What did we talk about today? Wow. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah, we got to be spirit-led. We were just talking You're about You're not spirit-led. you got problems. Knowing truth is a consequence of reading, meditating on, and understanding God's word. It also depends on the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The ability to discern demonic deception is a spiritual gift that sovereignly comes from God. Many times when battling demons, we have prayed that the Holy Spirit would empower us with wisdom to know what to do next. We've seen God miraculously intervene in such circumstances because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, has supernaturally given me direction. So we use this verse to seek more of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. There has been times where we've been in uh, exorcisms, uh, as we call them, casting out demons. Deliverance. Deliverance. Uh, during these times where the Holy Spirit has shown me the name of the demon because it was lying and didn't want to have to leave. So we would go back and forth with the different kinds of names. But the Holy Spirit is there to guide you into all truth. So, remember that scripture, John 16, 13. All right, let's, we're almost done. We're almost done here. Oh, yes. Oh, this one. Oh, ooh, ooh. oh the devil hates this one. <laughs> Isaiah 14, 12. That's awesome. Through 15. Now, bye -bye. we just use 12, but we like to go all the way to 15, right, Kath? <laughs> I know you do. Oh, I love all of it. Yeah. All right, so awesome. I'm going to read that. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. <laughs> you didn't hear me read I this. will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north. I'll ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. That's right. <clears throat> and that's how we speak it at the enemy. If you wonder. So Satan hates that scripture because it reveals the eternal defeat he suffered when he dared to rebel against God. That's right. Satan delights in reminding each of us of our sinful past, but he doesn't want to be reminded of his own past yep. or of his future. So chapter 14 of Isaiah tells us that Satan is a fallen being. Though he appears pompous and powerful, the devil forfeited his first estate and now only mimics the glory he had in heaven. Jesus says Christ was foreordained to trample the devil under his feet. 
So we too can conquer Satan through Christ's power. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly, according to Romans 16, 20. So, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, we use this verse, these verses, to put Satan's power in perspective. Oh boy, he hates that. Oh, and this one. Oh, this one's big. You guys prepared? Bam! Put on yeah. the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ah! He hates that because he knows the armor of God cannot be penetrated. That's right. And every tactic of his warfare is useless against it. Amen. Satan has no offense against the defense of God's armor. So, just as every vital part of the physical body is protected by armor described in Ephesians chapter 6, we are also spiritually protected in every aspect of our relationship with Christ when we put on this protection. When I face a, a difficult ba spiritual battle, I know something's coming. Or when I sense I'm under the attack of extreme spiritual oppression, I sometimes stand and go through the motions of putting on God's armor. I mean, literally stand and we do it. Me and both Kathy, I've seen Kathy do it. Oh yeah, <laughs> I do it all the time. So, by physically emphasizing what God's word says, we demonstrate to the devil how serious we are about protecting ourselves against his advances. So, you use this verse to assume a defensive posture when the devil oppresses you. Bam! Full armor of God. That's right. Ah, loving it. So, these are the scriptures we found effective towards warding off the enemy's attacks. People, I want to encourage you to contemplate other passages which may be equally effective in your own life. And when you discover that the Holy Spirit has used a certain Bible verse to help you overcome evil, note it, okay? Write it down. Better yet, memorize it. Have the Word of God with you always to defeat the devil daily in every way. Jesus showed us how it was done. Jesus went and he got tempted by the devil and he told the devil every word that the devil did not want to hear. And this is why I'm giving you this today. Ten scriptures that Satan hates the most. You can use these. Memorize them. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is why we put the word on our heart. This is why I tell people, memorize the word. Now, we don't have a lot of time, but we have time to be in the word, don't we? That's right. Every single day, we have time. Amen. So, can I, can I throw one thing in? Um, just for, just to throw it out there for those of you who you know we use two different words exorcism and deliverance exorcism is a more general term so if he really wanted to use that so that everybody understands what we're talking about when we say deliverance but that exorcism and deliverance is the same thing just want to let you know yeah so praying in the spirit all right puts on the armor and it's the power that makes it work so you got to pray you got to fast if, if sometimes you're you're told by the Holy Spirit he'll tell you to fast because these kind will not come out but by fasting and prayer but I want to go through the motion with you now Kathy does it different so I'm gonna go through yeah wait. he'll do it as the shoes word. of the gospel of peace you got to put those on got to put your sh battle shoes on right then we go up here we put on the belt of truth huh got to have that breast of righteousness right Yep. Ah. Uh -huh. Then you put on the helmet of salvation. You got to have with you the shield of faith. That's right. And you got to have the sword of the spirit. Don't forget any of it. Which is the word of God. So with me, I always go from top to bottom. I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I gird my loins with truth, having shod my feet with the gospel of peace having the shield of faith and the word of God, and I am claiming victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. Glory to God. Armor it up. 
armor it up people and remember use the word of god it is literally a sword against the enemy he cannot stand it when you quote the word of god absolutely it is a literal sword Desiree. a literal sword in the spirit he hates it so I'm gonna stop here now, and I'm gonna don't don't go nowhere because Kathy, I think she has some things to share. Yep. But I'm gonna stop recording, and uh, you guys have a very blessed uh, September 13, 2020. What's left of it? And for some of you out there, I know it's daylight. <laughs> I know that you're gonna have a, a great day and be blessed, right? Amen. All right. <laughs>